The last 30 years of the 19th century had seen the Canadian militia armed with the Snyder Enfield. Long past its prime and obsolete, it was replaced from 1895 by the magazine Lee Enfield. This new rifle would equip the Canadian militia with a relatively modern rifle, which would stand in good stead as it found itself at war in South Africa, fighting the Boers from 1899 to 1902, fighting alongside the other armies of the empire. The wastage of war was a new concept for Canada, and the government found itself having to acquire more rifles. Inquiries were made in Great Britain to see if a sizable order could be accommodated. It could not, due to the excessive demand placed on the trade by the hugely committed British Army. Nor would a license be granted to produce the magazine Lee Enfield in Canada. Therefore, some other solution would have to be sought. So began one of the most controversial and infamous stories in Canadian military history. The eventual adoption of this the Ross Rifle. As the 20th century approached, Canada found herself affected by an international crisis. A dispute over the colonial territory between Venezuela, backed by the United States, and the British Empire in British Guiana put Canada on the front line. Fears of military action or even invasion sparked immediate and considerable attention paid towards Canada's military forces. By the mid-1890s, the militia had been making do with the Snyder Enfield as its service rifle, since it had been issued in the late 1860s. With no perceived threat, or the political or indeed monetary wherewithal to keep the militia up to date as it pertained to small arms, the Snyder soldiered on well past its prime into obsolescence. The crisis in Venezuela proved to be a final straw. The militia would have to be rearmed. Just then, entering service, the brand new Mark I magazine Lee Enfield was narrowly decided upon to replace the Snyder. As a result, the purchase of some 40,000 of these brand new rifles was made and issue began in 1896. Interestingly, Canada was issued these rifles before their counterparts in the British Army, to whom its issue was a much more gradual affair. This was a timely decision, for just a few years later, Canada was at war in South Africa, fighting the Boers. The decision to send forces to assist those already in South Africa was made, and numerous contingents of infantry, artillery, mounted infantry, and medical personnel were dispatched. And, as had not been the case since 1870, the Canadian Army was fighting with rifles that were the most up-to-date in the British Empire. What became apparent was an ongoing need for more rifles. The wastage of war put a strain on the supply of small arms that was needed to keep the army in the field, as well as arm the militia at home. Eyes were turned to Great Britain, indeed the very place where the Lee Enfield had initially come from in the 1890s. The requests for more rifles fell on deaf ears, nor was the invitation to build the rifles in Canada accepted. It was into this vacuum of sorts that the people, places, and personalities would fall which would create the circumstances for the eventual adoption and retention of the Ross. The story of this rifle begins with the Scottish entrepreneur Sir Charles Ross, and his association with Canada begins during the Boer War. Sir Charles had been involved in rifle design since the 1890s and had arrived at a design that copied heavily from the Austrian Mannlicher. He had financed a facility in Connecticut and in 1897 the first rifles were being produced. These first rifles were for sporting purposes and went through a number of changes. Ever the entrepreneur, Ross produced versions of his rifles with military features in the hopes of enticing military interest, namely those of Great Britain and the United States neither were interested. Ross eventually settled on certain design features, and this proto-service rifle was waiting in the wings when Canada came looking for a solution to its arms issue. Ross served in South Africa as the commander of a machine gun battery of Locke's Horse, a volunteer mounted infantry unit very typical of the hastily raised units used in that conflict. It was while in South Africa that he met Sam Hughes of the Canadian Army which of course also had contingents serving there. 
perhaps taken with Ross's pre-war efforts to build rifles. Indeed, his machine gun battery was armed with them. Hughes would later become the second name to be associated with Canada and the Ross. Remember that this was around the time that Canada was facing a shortage of small arms, and none were seemingly forthcoming. Hughes, being a relatively senior officer in the small Canadian army, perhaps had knowledge of this. As a man who was undoubtedly full of himself, Hughes perhaps saw himself as the man with an answer, having discovered a way to have rifles produced in Canada, rifles which would be made by Ross. The government of the day was made aware, and perhaps out of frustration and bitterness at the fact that the previous legitimate requests for rifles had gone unheeded in the mother country, Canada stampeded towards her own autonomous military rifle manufacturing capability. The man ultimately responsible for bringing Ross into the fold was this man, Sir Frederick Borden, the Minister of Militia and Defence. In 1901, he offered Ross a tentative agreement to build some 62,000 rifles at $30 each. A committee was formed to assess the Ross's suitability, on which many Ross-friendly men were placed, including Sam Hughes. Perhaps tellingly, a Colonel Cartwright, who was the Commandant of the School of Musketry, was not named as a member. One of the activities ordered by the committee was a trial of the prototype rifle. For this, Ross submitted a militarized version of his 1900 pattern rifle. Twelve tests were undertaken with Ross's prototype. This was compared to the existing magazine Lee Enfield. In ten of these tests, the two rifles performed rather evenly, but in two of them in particular, the Ross proved quite deficient. A stress test with overcharged rounds ended with the Ross having to be kicked open. After two rounds, Sir Charles removed his rifle from the test. <laughs> The magazine Lee Enfield digested the overcharged rounds with ease. An endurance test of a thousand rounds saw the magazine Lee Enfield pass without fault, while the Ross became stiff after every 50 rounds and misfed and jammed repeatedly. After 300 rounds, the front sight, which had been fixed with common solder, fell off. <laughs> These deficiencies were explained away, blamed on ammunition tolerances and features characteristic of a prototype. The committee, however, did make some recommendations, suggesting a change to the magazine as well as to the front sight. Despite the deficiencies listed in the trial, by March 1902, Ross had a contract. From an entrepreneurial side, this contract was a veritable gold mine. Ross could set up shop and import all his necessary materials duty-free. As well, his production was not just limited to military rifles, but sporting ones as well. So stated, all he had to do was provide 12,000 rifles in the first year and 10,000 annually after that. There was some opposition, particularly from Great Britain, who argued against the Ross due to its non-uniformity within the Empire. A trial of two Ross carbines made in 1902 resulted in the urging of Canada to adopt, presumably, the short magazine Lee Enfield just then coming into service. This time it was Canada's deaf ears, as the contract with Ross had been signed some two months beforehand. Surprisingly, there doesn't appear to be any underhandedness in relation to the Ross contract. No kickbacks or patronage seems to be associated. Certainly, naivety towards the requirements of a service rifle and a certain degree of frustration play heavily. This and the obvious nationalism associated with Canada producing her own rifle. Now, it's important to realize that the Ross rifle that was used during the Great War, the Mark III, was a very different rifle to what was initially produced in 1903. Between that date and 1910, there were three marks of Ross rifle, some of which underwent extensive modifications which were denoted using the characteristic stars. A full examination of the marks and stars is perhaps the subject for another video as the true complexity of the development and changes made becomes clear with just a cursory amount of research. As mentioned, the Mark III Ross had predecessors which differed considerably to the final product. The Mark I, which was found nearly immediately to have serious faults, was superseded by the Mark II. Outwardly similar to the Mark I, the Mark II went through a bewildering number of changes, and even a stint as the Mark III, before its redesignation as the Mark II Two star. These early marks were distinctive in their internal five-round Harris magazines, 
with their peculiar, manually depressed platform. The Mark II pattern would eventually end up with modifications totaling five stars worth. Interestingly, these early Marks did not have the capacity for charger loading, something which has been discussed at length on the channel, and surprisingly, this wasn't allotted for until 1912, when the addition of an after-the-fact combined charger bridge and sight base was added to the Mark II two-star. These Mark II pattern rifles, many of which still did not have the capacity for charger loading, remained in the hands of the Canadian militia right up to the beginning of the First World War. The rifle took its final form in the Mark III. The first delivery of the Mark III Ross was made in December of 1912. This is the rifle that would eventually arm the Canadian Expeditionary Force and that first contingent, the 1st Canadian Division, when it landed at Saint Nazaire in 1915. My Ross is a Mark III and it exhibits the hallmarks of that pattern of rifle. If there's one thing about the Ross, uh, apart from its reputation, it's its silhouette. The rifle is long, 50 and one half inches, with a 30 and one half inch barrel. It weighs some 9 pounds 14 ounces. The stock is full length to within about 4 inches from the muzzle, where it terminates with a nose cap fitted with a bayonet lug and piling swivel. There's a handguard that covers the top of the barrel over its rear half, which is secured by a barrel band, also mounting the front sling swivel. The Mark III featured a new pattern of bolt head, which differed in detail from those found on the Marks I and II. This featured a multi-lug or interrupted screw design. This chambered rounds from the horizontal position rather than the vertical as before. This arrangement locked into the breech with a series of corresponding threads. The magazine was external and held five rounds in a single stack. The internals were a rather complicated affair with a pair of spring-loaded magazine lips, an arm-mounted platform, and other internal spacers. The size of the breech, where one will find many markings, betrays the strength of the action. The rear sight base performed three functions. It held the 1903 Springfield-style bolt stop, which also functioned as a magazine cutoff. It mounted the back sight, and at its front and slightly offset, there was a charger guide for the charging of magazines. The back sight was quite complex, but more on that later. To remove the bolt, first, after the necessary safety precautions, the safety was moved forward to the fire position. The bolt stop was rotated to its center position. A point to note about this is the fact that when the back sight is folded down, it makes it very difficult to access the top edge of the bolt stop. By lifting the sight, it can be accessed much more easily. Then the bolt could simply be slid fully to the rear from underneath the rear sight base. A point to note here is that the bolt head wants to rotate through 90 degrees upon removal due to the spring tension within the sleeve. Here you can see the bolt head's arrangement with its multiple lugs and large extractor on the right hand side. Also shown here is the pin through the sleeve which ensures that the bolt cannot be assembled incorrectly. To replace the bolt, first the bolt head was moved forward to the unlocked position. Then the bolt was replaced, allowing the guideways to feed along the guides of the receiver. And the bolt pushed fully home. The bolt stop was moved to the upward position, locking the bolt in place. Springs were eased and the safety moved to the safe position. The back sight could then be folded down. Here's the evolution from another angle. Note the extension of the cocking piece as the bolt is pushed forward, cocking the action. The sights on the Ross are in stark contrast to those found on the SMLE. Officially known as the Sight Ross Elevating Screw with Aperture, but also known as the Ross Battle Aperture Sight, this style of back sight was found on the Mark III and was also retrofitted to some Mark II two-star match rifles. It had a number of interesting features. Contained within a modified rectangular frame, which had an area at its top right removed to accommodate the charger guide when folded, was a slide with a screw type elevating mechanism. The slide had an aperture that measured 1 16th of an inch and a series of two open battle sights, one for use when the sight was folded and one for use when the sight was up. The aperture was used for fine shooting and could be adjusted from 2 to 1200 yards using the elevating screw. 
the battle sights were calibrated for point-blank shooting to 600 yards with the sight folded and 1,000 yards when the sight was up and the slide was at its lowest elevation. The slide could also be adjusted laterally using the wind gauge, which was marked with lines representing 5 minute of angle. In addition to the range markings found at the front of the ladder, the sight could also be adjusted by means of the vernier type scale which was found on the side of the ladder, with each line representing two minutes of elevation. Despite its apparent complexity, it really is no more so than the number one back sight found on the number four rifle used during the Second World War. The front sight on my Ross is a rather wide version of a blade sight and I'm not quite sure if it was indeed a barleycorn that has been filed off or it was intended to be that way from the outset. Known as the Bayonet Ross Mark II, the bayonet used with the Mark III Ross was initially of a rather peculiar style. Its butter knife style profile seemed to lend itself more to household use than as a weapon of war. This rounded point gave way partly due to the acceptance that the former pattern was not good for the performance of the bayonet's primary role, stabbing. It was from October 1915 modified, or newly made with an equally distinctive angled point. As you can see, this is the style of bayonet that I possess. They were used with the 1908 pattern web equipment, and that set's entrenching to a carrier was somehow attached. There is some evidence to suggest that a web frog with attachment points for the entrenching tool held carrier was locally and seemingly unofficially produced. Ammunition used with the Ross was the ubiquitous Mark 7. Held in chargers containing five rounds, the chargers themselves were packed in bandoliers to hold a total of 50 rounds. These were often used to augment the 150 round capacity of the 1908 pattern equipment. I also have shot my cast loads, which consist of a 210 grain cast bullet atop 24 grains of 4227. Loading of the Ross was generally similar to other bolt action charger loaded rifles of the era. First, the safety catch was moved to the fire position. The bolt was opened by pulling straight back on the bolt handle, and a charger of five rounds was withdrawn from the pouch. This was placed on the charger guide and the rounds pushed into the magazine. The bolt was then closed and the safety catch moved to the safe position. Of particular note is the way in which the charger guide holds the charger off at a slight angle to the right. Here you can see the straight, linear, non-rotating motion of operating the bolt. As noted earlier, two sprung lips hold the rounds in the magazine. As the bolt moves forward, it pushes the round and its rim through these lips and into the chamber. Here, from a different angle, you can see the round being fed up the ramp into the chamber by the face of the bolt. And in the last part of forward movement, you can see the actual rotation of the bolt. My initial shooting efforts were limited to 100 yards and were very much experimental in nature. I decided to use some actual Mark 7 ammunition that was donated to the channel by a friend, Mike, who kindly opened his stash of Greek Mark 7 ball and donated 50 or so to the cause. As expected, the ammunition performed reasonably well. Thanks ever so much, Mike. By far, the best aspect of the Ross is its sights. The combination of the aperture and the fully hooded front sight are a winning combination, aligning quickly and easily. The weight of the Ross makes for a solid, stable platform, and the long barrel affords a wonderfully corresponding sight radius. Well, I'm pretty happy with that. There's the five two in the same hole there, that's uh, two and a half inches, um, essentially out, out of the box. As you can see, I need to bring the sights down. This is reflective of my jimmying the sights just to see where uh, they need to be set. This of course being with Mark 7 ammunition. I'm gonna tell you though, 
this front sight, it's like a Mars bar. From 100 yards, its width takes up nearly the entire distance here across the bottom of the, uh, the figure five silhouette here. That gets huge. One other point to make is the fact, of, the fact that it's an aperture sight. And that uh, combined with the round hood on the front sight uh, makes aiming, well, it couldn't be any easier really. One thing that I noticed was that the ejection mechanics of the rifle tend to throw the brass a considerable distance to the right. Not at all a consideration in the military context, but for the purposes of a recreational historical shooter. Having to search for brass that has been thrown six or seven feet into bush or tall grass can be a bit of a challenge to find. So far, the use of the charger with the Ross has been acceptable, if a bit finicky. Not as forgiving as the SMLE, it sometimes seems to bind and jam in the process of loading. This may certainly be related to the condition of the rifle and the magazine internals of my example, or it could be just me. General use of the Ross so far has been pleasant enough. Rosses found today will invariably have had any number of fixes, changes and modifications done to them, which were performed some hundred years ago as the Canadian Army and government tried desperately to remedy not only the material faults with the rifle, but also the collapsing confidence of the men who were forced to use it in those early years of the war. My example hasn't suffered from any of the faults commonly associated with the Ross stands to reason, as it undoubtedly has gone through the battery of improvements. When used in the way it's intended to be, the action cycles cleanly and quickly. Of particular note, the battle sights provide an easy and quick alternative to the use of the fully deployed back sight. The rifle is indeed a bit of a handful. In open ground, this obviously is not much of an issue. In the confines of a trench, it probably would have been more of a hindrance. Interestingly, and important to mention, the overall length of the Ross and bayonet is nearly identical to that of the SMLE with its bayonet. Seeing as how the bayonets were fixed for both attack and defense, the issue of the Ross being more of an encumbrance in action can be somewhat placed in a better context. The five-round magazine, while not a weak link in the design, does require somewhat more attention than the 10-round magazine of the SMLE. Well, for the initial engagement anyway. Although heavier than the SMLE, I haven't found it excessively so. Nor was I forced to spend extra attention to accommodate this extra weight when carrying, loading, aiming and firing. The issue of the Mark III Ross in 1914, which was essentially a brand new rifle, did nothing to alleviate issues regarding serviceability. This new and untrialed rifle was prone to jam. It had issues with weak firing pin springs, and the bayonet was found to periodically detach when firing. The rifle wouldn't fit in the cavalry's rifle buckets, nor would it fit properly on artillery limbers, and they slipped, causing damage to the spokes of the wheels. Perhaps most distressingly, there were rumors of bolts blowing back into the hands and faces of troops firing them. This was due to a design feature which allowed the bolt to be assembled incorrectly. By the manual, stripping of the bolt was an armorer's job, but as properly trained armorers were a scarcity, one can only surmise that rifles returning from the armorer where they had been worked on, some even to retrofit, to accommodate the old Mark VI ammunition which was used to alleviate Shortages of Mark 7 had the bolts assembled incorrectly and given back to the troops. Troubles intensified as the division sailed to England and then after the winter entered the line in early 1915 in France. It was found that the chambers would not accept British-made ammunition, which was made to larger tolerances and the chamber of the Ross made to very small ones. This was perhaps the most critical issue, and all through the late winter and spring of 1915 confidence waned. After the horror and desperation that was the German gas attack at the Second Battle of Ypres, the 1st Division unofficially adopted the SMLE, 
finally ridding the men of their unreliable and troublesome rosses. Fixes were implemented, both to existing weapons as well as to production, but new quality control faults, including badly hardened bolt heads, bolt stops that were too small, and poorly seasoned wood were found on new production rifles that were equipping the newly raised 2nd and 3rd Divisions. By 1916, there was total condemnation of the rifle, and Haig, the overall commander of the British Expeditionary Force and thus the Canadians, directed the Ross to be withdrawn and replaced by the SMLE, relegating the Ross to training and other second-line roles until enough SMLEs were acquired to replace the Ross in even these roles. Sam Hughes resisted the withdrawal of the Ross until the very end. By then, he had fallen with his darling rifle, and both were replaced by mid-1916. Mention should be made about the uniform used for this video. It is a representation of that of a member of the 16th Battalion, Canadian Expeditionary Force, in the early part of the war. When the 1st Division was formed in Valcartier, the various regimental contingents from across Canada, many of which were considerably under battalion strength, were grouped to form new battalions under the CEF structure. In one of these cases, some 530 men of the 72nd Seaforth Highlanders of Canada from Vancouver, some 230 from the 50th Gordon Highlanders in Victoria, 250 from the 79th Cameron Highlanders of Canada in Winnipeg, and some 140 men from the 91st Canadian Highlanders, Argyle and Sutherland, from Hamilton, Ontario, were joined to form what became the 16th Battalion, Canadian Expeditionary Force. Although a cap badge was designed for this new CEF battalion, the 16th existed, especially in its early years, very much as a sum of its parts. The four companies were organized along antecedent regimental lines, with each man continuing to wear the kit of his parent regiment. The battalion was eventually given the nickname of the Canadian Scottish to reflect the amalgamated nature of its birth. Photographic evidence confirms this somewhat mishmash of kit. Therefore, in keeping with the traditions of the channel, I have presented the Ross in the guise of a man of the 16th who originally had come from Vancouver and the 72nd. The Dice Glengarry with regimental badge, not yet replaced by the 16th Battalion version. The Mackenzie kilt, and the use of boots and putties all correspond to this early part of the war and the use of the Ross. The 16th's first major action came at 2nd Ypres in 1915 where they, in conjunction with the 10th Battalion, made a joint night attack on a feature known as Kitchener's Wood outside the small town of St. Julian in a desperate attempt to take it from the Germans. The attack went in and both battalions were able to get into the wood. Savage hand-to-hand -hand fighting developed and with ammunition running low and total confusion reigning, the remnants of both battalions were withdrawn to the southern edge of the wood. This daring night attack became one of the most storied events in 16th Battalion history, and to this day, the regiments that perpetuate these battalions, the Calgary Highlanders perpetuating the 10th Battalion, and the Canadian Scottish perpetuating the 16th Battalion, both wear distinctive shoulder titles to commemorate this action. As the 1st Division was still armed with the Ross at this time, I felt it pertinent to choose this representation to present the rifle in this video. And yes, throughout this video, my kilt is a shade on the high side, even for me. For further viewing on the Ross, I might recommend two channels and two videos in particular. Forgotten Weapons and Sea and Arsenal have both made particularly excellent quality videos regarding the Ross rifle. Ian from Forgotten Weapons has made a very definitive video on the myths and realities surrounding the bolt of the Ross. In it, he tests the effect of the bolt being assembled incorrectly, placed in the weapon, and then fired. This video is an excellent example of what one might call practical or experimental archaeology. C and Arsenal treated the Ross to their high-quality long format so enjoyed by their viewers. Athias and May delved into the history and circumstances of the Ross, and I can't recommend the video enough as the best single source of information in this format. Although I can't imagine viewers of this channel not being aware of the other two, stop by and say hello. The links for both these videos are in the description below. Of the references found to use in this video, two stand out. What amounts to being the Bible 
in relation to information on the Ross, the Ross Rifle Story by Phillips, Dupuy, and Chadwick. And equally as interesting, but dealing with the complete pantheon of Canadian military small arms, Defending the Dominion by Edgecombe. The sling used on my Ross was made by Shed Time Leather. From his workshop in the UK, Lawrence produces a large array of leather accessories including rifle slings for most military periods. When I had need of a brown leather example, Lawrence was the first person I called on. Made with high quality workmanship and materials, I don't think you could find a better sling anywhere. If you're in the market for such a piece, contact him through his Facebook page at Shed Time Leather. Lawrence has also taken on projects that include pouches and bandoliers for various military equipments of the 19th century. By all accounts, these pieces are excellent and rank amongst the very best on the market. And finally, very special thanks goes to friend of the channel, Henry. If it hadn't been for his timely message and the kind offer to broker a deal, the Ross would still be a distant dream. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.